Welcome to Health Hackers episode 52. Today's recording comes to you more than seven months into the COVID-19 global pandemic. While work continues on creating a vaccine and testing pharmaceutical treatment methods, I want you to hear from this week's guest who has turned her medical focus towards avoiding the virus with lifestyle strategies that are backed by science. Dr. Gina Serioko is a board certified internal medicine and integrative medicine practitioner, as well as functional medicine practitioner here in California. She works for the Palo Alto Medical Foundation and has seen the effects of COVID-19 firsthand, having diagnosed and advised survivors of the virus. In this episode, Dr. Gina will be telling us about her research, her clinical observations, and even some of her own lifestyle habits for supporting and optimizing the body's immune system against viruses. You are going to hear things about citrus peel, green tea, antacids, breathing, vitamin P, and more that I bet you haven't heard before. A quick note to new viewers and listeners, anything you hear or see on Health Hackers should not be considered personal or medical advice. You know the score, always talk to your own health provider about your concerns. Dr. Gina, welcome. Thank you. So before we get into our conversation about lifestyle medicine, I would really like to know, what does it feel like to be a doctor during a global pandemic, seeing patients with this virus that feels so new and has a lot of unknowns around it. Yeah, you know, um, I think I went into medicine to serve, to serve people in good times and bad times. And this is one of those really surprising times, you know. Um, I think though, what I've come away with after the next, the, the months have gone by is the incredible resilience that people have. And, and by and large, when we take care of our bodies, by and large, people do pretty good. So I think initially it was battling a lot of that inner fear, that natural fear of the unknown. And now as we get more and more information, we have a little bit more idea of what we can do for ourselves, for each other, to really be strong during this time. When I watched your webinar, which was all about optimizing the immune system, you outlined some of the basics around COVID risk, not all of which I was actually aware of. Um, it would be good if you could remind us of those or tell us about, for example, the most contagious time frame and how the virus actually gets inside the body. Yeah, exactly. So I think of it as two things. One is let's not get it in the first place and two, not, let's not give it if we accidentally have it. So in terms of not getting it, we can, other people around us can be contagious with the virus two to three days before you even have any symptoms. That's the sneaky thing about this virus. So someone can look fine, be fine, even be going for a jog and they might be spreading the virus around. So that's the main thing. The second thing is that when you are um, uh, in a room, for example, we're now understanding how the virus actually gets transmitted. And some of it is from droplets, which is how the masks are really, really important. But now we're actually understanding some of it is from aerosols. And aerosols is kind of like, if you think about walking into a room and there's one person smoking, the fumes are kind of around. Now we know that aerosols hold the coronavirus. So imagine walking into a room and trying to avoid the fume from that one person who's smoking. That makes it a little bit more scary. But when you understand that, you then can take steps to say, okay, I'm going to try to do most of my interactions outdoors. I'm going to try to stay at least six feet apart to avoid most of the droplets and aerosols. And if I have to be indoors, let's try to be indoors as little as possible and choose spaces that are as least crowded as possible. Those two to three days before a person begins to show symptoms, are they the days when a person is most contagious, do you believe? Exactly. So that's also the scary thing. I mean, we're contagious as long as we have symptoms, but we're very contagious the two to three days prior. So when we talk about supporting or strengthening our immune system, what does that actually mean? So when I give talks about supporting the immune system, I'm actually branching it into two different things. So I think about our own internal army, okay? Our, vi our, our immune system is one of the most high-tech, highly advanced, amazing systems on the planet in terms of fighting a virus. So think of us as, as having a whole special ops team inside of us. So when we're boosting the immune system, it's how do we 
really make sure our special ops team are highly trained and ready to go and have all the supplies they need. But the other way of thinking about it is, let's just say we have a good military inside of us, but they're fighting with each other. They're bombing and setting fires and there's just a lot of inflammation going on inside. Well, if that's happening inside, then when an actual viral enemy comes, we're not gonna be as ready to fight. So I talk about lowering the body's internal inflammation so that you have more bandwidth to fight if a virus comes on board. So those are the two things I think about. So let's talk about these steps to help lower a person's level of inflammation. Um, in terms of nutrition, when you were looking into the evidence around foods and immunity, what stood out for you? Yeah, so you know, when we talk about the body's inflammation, we think about things that are um, decreasing internal fire. So for example, a lot of the research has shown that those who are more susceptible to illness in a, this pandemic are ones who maybe have uncontrolled diabetes or uncontrolled hypertension or more sedentary or eating more junk food. I don't know if you saw, but Mexico actually in some other states have banned junk food to minors because of the link of junk food causing inflammation in the body. And then the opposite is actually true. When we eat foods that are from the earth, our colorful vegetables, our fruits, our nuts, studies actually show this decreases the inflammation in the body. And um, these are things like, um, yeah, vet, anything that's colorful and from the ground basically can decrease the inflammation in the body. Is it tricky to generalize nutrition advice given that each individual's biochemistry is so unique or do you think that basically if it's a colorful vegetable it's going to help everyone yeah I, you know in general I, I think we try to make nutrition too complicated you know there's all these different fancy diets out there honestly I tell people if your great great grandma recognizes it as a food it's a food if it came from the earth or if it came from a farm or if it came from a garden it's probably good for you. If it came from a factory, if you have to open a package, if it has a bunch of ingredients that you can't pronounce, it's more likely than not causing inflammation and not quite serving your body and your immune system. So tell us about citrus peel and green tea I had you talk about. Oh yeah, so this is this was just really cool. So when, when the pandemic was first starting, I thought, gosh, there must be a way to empower people to understand that we can, we have the machinery within us to get better. And as I was researching that, I found all of these things called molecular docking studies. So let me just explain that really quick because I have a prop. When somebody coughs on us, let's say, and even though we're wearing our mask, maybe we breathed in some of the virus, the virus actually needs to attach to the cells in our body. And it does that through a little docking receptor, okay? So let's just say this is our little virus and it's coming in and it docks. And then it's like pushing, it's like pushing an elevator button. Push the elevator button, oop, come into the cell. And then it starts the process of infection. Well, molecular docking studies are saying, hmm, what else fits in this so we can block it so the virus can't hit that elevator button? And these are studies that are used widely in the pharmaceutical industry to find new drugs that will get us what we want. Well, it turns out when you use those same research studies on vegetables, we can find ingredients on, in vegetables that also block that same elevator button. And it turns out there are ingredients in citrus and citrus peel called hesperidin that binds that very well. So then the virus can't get in. Um, things like quercetin found in onions and apples and honey does the same thing. And actually a component of green tea also does the same thing. So even though a lot of what we hear is looking for a good drug to help with COVID and smart people are working on that. We wanna use what nature has given us already, nature's medicine and these molecular docking studies, while they don't prove that green tea are gonna be you know, keeping you from getting COVID, we, these are foods that we know are just good for other things. We wanna still, even in a pandemic, keep heart disease away and strokes away and cancer away and dementia away. And these are all the same foods that also help the immune system. And now we know, maybe antiviral as well. How do you incorporate green tea and citrus peel 
into your daily diet? And should everyone do so? I mean, in your terms of seeing your patients, is this something you recommend to them? I do. I mean, you know, green tea is wonderfully anti-inflammatory and there's so much research on um, heart health, brain health, anti-cancer. So I actually have my sort of green tea cup this morning and I recommend it to anyone who's not sensitive to caffeine. Um, in my morning juice, I don't typically recommend juice, but some days I start with a little bit of, you know, celery and lemon juice and I will throw in the whole lemon. So some of that hesperidin from the peel is getting in to the juice as well. And certainly when I do a smoothie, I will do that. And, um, you know, sometimes people will garnish their foods with a little lemon lemon zest. I just encourage people to be a little bit more liberal with the lemon zest. Now I had never heard of vitamin P um, until I heard you mention it. Will you tell us what it is and where we find it and why it's good? Right. So vitamin P was basically the original name that scientists gave to this mysterious thing in foods that they knew was really, really good for you, but they couldn't just quite figure out what it was. Now with more science, of course, vitamin P turns out to be a whole category of ingredients in food called bioflavonoids. So these are the ingredients in food that give it color and flavor and really is the medicinal part of these colorful foods. So bioflavonoids are things like the quercetin that I already mentioned um, in these wonderful food products that serve as anti-inflammatory, but also possibly antiviral. Quercetin, I know you can also buy as a supplement. Have you seen any convincing evidence that certain supplements can help the body resist a viral infection? Do you take quercetin, for example? Yeah, I, you know, I love this question, Gemma, because um, there's actually a lot of good research coming out right now in terms of supplements. Now, when I think of research, there's a couple different categories. One is the double-blinded randomized control, placebo-controlled trial, which is saying, yes, this is or does or does not affect something. And then there's other evidence that are like sort of anecdotal or ob observational trials. For example, we now know um, that when people are deficient in vitamin D, they're two times as likely to test positive for COVID. And we had other trials showing that if you're deficient in vitamin D and we give you vitamin D, you're a lot less likely to get the common cold. So um, this is really convincing information that everyone would maybe want to check a vitamin D level and see if you need to take extra. In the setting of quercetin, current studies are happening right now to see if taking quercetin every day does translate into protection from COVID. We don't have that research yet, but I am taking quercetin every day in addition to lots of colorful fruits and vegetables and onions and apples um, because it turns out that quercetin, quercetin, in addition to blocking that elevator button, actually is something called a zinc ionophore. It helps to get zinc into the cells. And there's a lot of research that zinc may be protective against COVID because it is protective against a lot of other viruses as well. And you may have heard about a drug that was on the news a lot earlier called hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine has a lot of different effects, but one of the key effects is that it is also a zinc ionophore. And scientists now think that's actually why the hydroxychloroquine was somewhat helpful uh, against COVID. So yes, I do recommend eating lots of high quercetin foods. And I personally do take quercetin twice a day. Um, it's also great for people who have allergies because it helps to decrease the allergic reactions as well. I have been taking quercetin twice a day. I started fairly recently. I'm trying to help with what I think are seasonal allergies, you know, runny nose, itchy eyes. But am I correct in thinking that actually there's a bit of a delay from when you start taking quercetin to when you could potentially see effects, is that right? Exactly, quercetin actually is not super bioavailable. And so there, you do need to take the right formulation and also enough of a dose. So I usually start people with a loading dose three times a day for a couple of weeks and then going down to twice a day, if not once a day. But it can take a little time for the effects actually to build up. So it's one of those vitamins where if you wanna know that you're doing a little extra for your immune system, it's one of those that you wanna start early not necessarily at the time of illness. So a lot of these like vitamin D to boost your immune system, good research, start that early. Um, and the quercetin start that early. Uh, zinc, I already talked about, you know, making sure you're a good vitamin, multivitamin has some zinc in it. Um, 
but there's also a really, really great research study um, by the Cochrane Review, which is kind of the gold standard in medical reviews, showing that at the first sign of illness, if you start feeling a little cough or itchy throat or anything, you start taking high doses of vitamin C, it does decrease the duration and the uh, severity of the illness. And we think that's because when you are sucking, for example, on a, uh, on a zinc lozenge, that it coats the throat. And remember I said, it helps to block the virus from actually able to get into the cell. So um, zinc is good, good ahead of time, but it's also good to increase the dose at the first sign of symptoms. So do you prefer to have an actual zinc lozenge then rather than a, a capsule I that you swallow? Do, I do. I, I think, you know, getting zinc in the body in any way is a good idea. Not too much. I wouldn't go more than 30 milligrams on average per day because that can offset other issues. But um, for people who are going to take it anyways, I do think there's a little extra bang for your buck if you take it as a zinc lozenge, particularly at the end of the day. So any after any possible exposures, let's say you were work, you know, um, in retail or you work in a dentist's office, I do think taking it at the end of the day, coating the back of the throat with that good zinc lozenge, just uh, making it last may offer some protection against any virus that might be trying to enter your body. And again, everybody, uh, Gina is not giving any medical advice here, but I'm interested, Gina, if you decide to offer advice to one of your patients in terms of taking a higher dose vitamin C, what, what kind of dose is high dose? Oh, so vitamin C, so vitamin C, oh, I love vitamin C. So here's the way to think about vitamin C. Think of it as water to a fire, okay? On an average day, if you're eating a healthy diet, you're getting enough vitamin C for your average day. Let's just say you have like a little campfire and to put out the campfire every night, you just need a little bucket of water. But if you were to get infected, that campfire all of a sudden became a forest fire. You're gonna immediately need a lot more water. And studies have shown that during an infection, you need at least 6,000 milligrams per day to maintain the level of vitamin C that you would normally have inside your cell. So right now, right at this minute, Cleveland Clinic is doing a research study where at the first sign of a positive COVID test, they are giving patients 8,000 milligrams of vitamin C spread out over a day, about 2,000 milligrams every six hours, plus 50 milligrams of zinc. And that research study we're all looking forward to, that should come out about next year. But if that is successful, if that truly shows that when people take high doses of vitamin C throughout the day, plus zinc at the first sign of COVID, and if they're feeling better and have less side effects, and perhaps even decrease this COVID long hauler syndrome possibility, that's going to be really exciting news because it's cheap, it's available, and for the more majority of people, it's 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 healthy and easy to do. So even though the the firm research isn't out yet, in my anecdotal experience, I've, I've treated over a hundred COVID positive patients now. I see that the patients who do what's being done in the study, taking high doses of vitamin C throughout the day they've just fared much better in on average than the patients that haven't. I kind of wish I went back and kept, you know, detailed notes on that. It wouldn't be an actual study, but it is observational. Um, and again, it's simply, very simply like the water to the fire. When you get COVID, all of a sudden the cap fire became a forest fire. That one bucket, bucket of water isn't going to be enough to put out the forest fire and you're going to need a lot more. That will be so interesting to see the results of that study uh, next year, won't it? Now, this isn't a supplement, but you mentioned before something very intriguing about a type of antacid medicine. Will you tell us about that? Yes. So pretty early on, we noticed that when people were really sick, even ending up in the hospital or the intensive care unit, people who just happened to be on famotidine, which is marketed as Pepsid, this is an antacid that people commonly take for heartburn or stomach issues. People who happened to be on famotidine trended towards doing better and not needing to stay in the ICU as long or actually less death rates. And so a lot of people were wondering, well, what is it about famotidine that 
helped. And even though it's an antacid, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that it's actually also a histamine blocker. Now, histamines, as you, you most people know, as causing allergies, sneezing, runny nose, swelling. But when you're in the middle of a septic infection, histamines can be part of the um, fueling the fire. So if someone is having serious symptoms and they happen to be on a histamine blocker, some of those symptoms get mitigated. Now, what I love, of course, coming down back to food as medicine is that vitamin C also decreases histamine. So vitamin C is a mast cell stabilizer. This is the kind of cell that releases histamines. So when you're taking appropriate levels of vitamin C, your mast cells are stabilized, therefore decreasing histamine release. And this might be part of the reason why I've noticed patients who are taking high dose vitamin C during illness actually do a little bit better. So let's talk about the mind now. And I know that you are trained in mindfulness meditation. How much of an impact do you think our mental well-being has on our physiological immunity? Oh, this is huge, right? I mean, I think probably most of us have experienced when we're under a lot of stress, our immune system goes down, right? The classic herpes cold sore that comes out when we're stressed or the classic college kid who crams all finals week and studies and then the day after the test catches a cold. So we know that mindset plays a huge role in the immune system. And this has actually been proven in research studies. There was a, a meta-analysis of 20 different meditation research studies which showed regular daily meditation actually decreases the inflammation level in your body, the actual cytokines, the molecules that contribute to inflammation. We have research to show that. So I love endorsing a mindful meditation practice. And, um, and some people find that really overwhelming, but there's really no wrong way to meditate. And with free apps and YouTube videos everywhere, it's just about giving ourselves permission to sit down for a few minutes and just quiet, create stillness, you know. Are there any simple practices that you do or that you recommend to your patients that you could tell us about? Yeah, so what I start with always, and I demonstrate this with my patients in clinic all the time, is just let's keep it simple with something called a four, seven, eight breath. And I actually learned this from my mentor, Dr. Andrew Weil, uh, during my integrative medicine fellowship. He's like the grandfather of integrative medicine in the US. This is called a four, seven, eight breath. And if it's okay, maybe I can just share it with you. I would love you to. So the idea is that you take a deep belly breath in for a whole big four counts, filling up your belly and chest. And then you pause for seven counts. And then you do a nice slow exhale, whoosh, for eight counts. So the idea is that anytime your exhale is longer than your inhale, your mind says, oh, I must be relaxed because I have time to exhale. So it's almost biohacking your body and biohacking your nervous system to relax. And I'll, I'll do a little demonstration. So it's an in on the four, pause on the seven, and out on the eight. It kind of looks like this. And immediately there's a sense of calm and relaxation. And even doing it two or three times in a row, you will just notice blood pressure dropping, heart rate dropping, and a sense of calm. And I like this because it's free. You could do it anywhere. You could do it at a stoplight, standing in line at the grocery store while you're in the bathroom. Um, so it's just a quick tool to engage in that breath work to then maybe be an invitation to create a mindfulness practice. So it was four, seven, eight. Four, seven, eight. Got it. In terms of movement, what kinds of physical exercise have been proven to have a positive effect on our immune system? Well, you know, I think, I think by now we all know that exercise is so important to you. But what studies have shown is that short bursts of moderate exercise are actually the best for your immune system. And in fact, one research study showed that people who do moderate short exercise daily have a 40 to 50% decreased risk of colds. And now we actually know biochemically why that works, but the key is moderate exercise. So 30 minutes of 
little bit short of breath, a little bit breathy, but still able to have a conversation, maybe a little sweaty or a little glisteny, but moderate. We know that people who are really doing those boot camps every day, actually what the research shows is two to six fold increase in colds when you're really going out doing that ultra marathon that was a little bit un, you know surprising for me to see but it kind of makes sense right if we go back to that army analogy if we overtrain our army is our army then going to be ready when that virus comes when we're just so exhausted so moderate exercise short bursts and the analogy I like to say is it's kind of like cleaning your house, right? If you tidy your house a little bit every day, then the house stays clean and looks pretty clean. If you only wait to clean your house once a month, then things get kind of messy and then gets clean, but then you might overdo it and then get sick. So 30 minutes, five days a week would be the target. Moderate exercise, you really don't have to go all out. And what I always tell my patients is any exercise is infinitely better than no exercise. So if you have 10 minutes, love those 10 minutes and feel really good about it. It's interesting what you said about potentially doing too much exercise. I recently did a review um, on Health Hackers of a blood test that tells you your biological age. Mm -hmm. And the co-founder of the company explained to me that they found that some people who go crazy at the gym actually had higher biological ages, which uh, came as a surprise but I guess makes sense if you're taxing your body so much. It does, and if we really think back to the primally, our primal bodies, when we're exercising really hard, the primal part of us doesn't know if we're exercising really hard or if we're running from a lion. So it does create a state of stress and inflammation in the body. Um, so everyone's gotta do what is, serves them, but I think it is a, good to know that actually too much hard exercise all the time is not in favor uh, to, to long-term wellness and longevity as, as far as we're able to see from the research right now. One of your current specialist interests I know is supporting immunity during pregnancy. In general, how have your pregnant patients been finding this pandemic? Are they particularly fearful? Yeah, you know, my pregnant women have been amazing. I think what happens when you're pregnant is you kind of go into this mama bear mode, right? You're protective and you're, you're aware and you're feeding yourself really well. So I think that my pregnant women have done really well during this whole thing. And I try to remind them that nature's on your side, just like our immune systems are on our side. And nature is gonna protect that baby at all costs. And if you think about just historically through time, babies have been born through much crazier times than now and, and they've done really well. So I try to give them that reinsurance and, and in general, they've done really well because most pregnant mamas are trying to do that foundational, eat food from the earth and get a little exercise. And, and I like to recommend getting enough sleep and doing a little of that meditation as well. Are there additional lifestyle measures that you recommend to your pregnant ladies to optimize their immunity? You know, um, because we're really careful about what goes into the body, um, those foundational steps are the key ones that I like to reinforce with them especially the one about sleep. So we didn't talk about melatonin as a supplement, but there's emerging research right now to show that melatonin, in addition to being a sleep hormone, is actually one of the most potent, uh, potent chemicals in our body to help boost the immune system and function as an antioxidant. And a little interesting note is that, you know, kids under 10 to 14 tend to do really well against the virus. Many of them don't even get sick or don't even get the contact, um, the virus at all. And what we know is that kids have much, much higher melatonin levels before they hit puberty. And as we get older, those melatonin levels go down, 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 down. And what we're studying now, there's actually a study in Spain giving all healthcare workers two milligrams of melatonin every night. And again, those research um, studies are going to be out next year. But the purpose of that two milligrams is not to help health workers sleep. It's actually to see if it decreases their risk of getting COVID because of all the different ways it boosts the immune system. Now, in pregnant women, we're not going to give melatonin because there are no studies on that. But one of the best ways to preserve your melatonin level is to make sure you try to turn off all the electronics on your computer, on your screens, on your lights by around 9 p.m. 
So the pineal gland in, in the brain is what makes the melatonin. And it starts to do that once the sun naturally goes down. But if we interfere with that, so sun went down, but all the lights are on, particularly the blue lights and the electronics, it shuts off the melatonin level. So I'm a little bit more emphatic with my pregnant women about the importance of really trying to wind down, shut down, um, use the blue light blockers on the electronics, maybe getting those blue light blocker glasses, because we want to preserve that melatonin level as much as possible as a natural antiviral agent. I'm really excited to hear what happens in that study as well with the melatonin. And now, when I first got in touch with you, it was after I watched a video of you giving a presentation on the prevention and reversal of early cognitive decline using lifestyle medicine. It was really remarkable to hear you say you can prevent and even reverse early Alzheimer's. Briefly, because I know we're nearly up on time and I've got to let you go, can you tell us a bit about those habits for a healthy brain that you outlined in that lecture? Yeah, you know, this is what I love about foundational medicine is when we talk about one thing that's good for you, it's really good for all of you. So I have a lot of elderly patients who are just really worried about dementia because they have a family history or they heard about the gene or what have you. And what we now know, just like preventing diabetes, just like boosting your immune system, we can do things to decrease the risk of dementia. And that is the same foundational stuff that we've talked about today wonderfully. It's eating from the earth and avoiding packaged things. Exercise actually increases something called BDNF in the brain, which is like miracle grow for the brain. So exercise, getting enough sleep. So that's when we restore and getting a lot of toxins out of our body and meditation and stress reduction. We have research showing that regular meditators actually grow the hippocampus in their brain. That's the part that stores memory. So our bodies are primed to heal and stay healthy as long as we put the good stuff in and keep the bad stuff out of the way. Superb. Um, Health Hackers listeners and viewers, I will put a link to Gina's presentation on dementia prevention. It's fascinating. In the summary text that goes with this podcast and video. Um, Gina, I know you're pretty new to posting on YouTube and Instagram, but should viewers and listeners expect to see more from you on social media in the near future? And if so, where can they find you? Yes, thank you. Well, I just officially started a YouTube channel, Gina Serioko MD, and I put a couple of my old webinars on there. I'm about to do a couple more on COVID and pregnancy and your immune system, and hopefully those will be up in the next couple of weeks. So check back and I hope to keep doing this. I just want to inform and share and empower people. Oh, that's wonderful. And that really comes through when you're talking. We can see that you really care. Thank you so much, Gina. That is it for this week. See you next time, everybody.